Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the podcast. If you're new here, my name is Farid Amin, I'm your host. And alhamdulillah, today I'm speaking to Sister Fatima Barakatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you? How's Ramadan going? Alhamdulillah, Ramadan is busy as usual. So Marshall, you have been very busy, you're a real busy bee. And um, this is uh, this is why I wanted you on that. I saw on Instagram that you are, you're fundraising for... So it was a conference, an academy, and then um, uh, campaigns for women. And it really, I was so intrigued when I saw this because yeah, I thought, Alhamdulillah, this sounds so exciting. And so I thought, yeah, I must get in touch with Fatima and, uh, so she can tell me. And I thought the listeners would love to hear what you're doing. So before we talk about those, those three main things that you're doing, um, why do, you know for Muslim women we are always um it's like they just will um society will not let us be yeah with um it, as in I'm thinking of for those of us who live in in the west in particular to just be a Muslim woman and, and practice your Islam it just seems to be there um it seems to be so difficult nowadays even though alhamdulillah we all want to just you know get on with worshipping Allah so what are the challenges that you think, well, I know there are many, but if you were saying, thinking of one or two of the major challenges that you feel Muslim women face in the 21st century, what, what would they be? Okay, well, <clears throat> I'd say, first of all, we do have to be aware that and put things into perspective, right? So I cringe a little bit when we, when our generation feels that or even the generation after us feel that they have it hard, you know, okay. when I think about my mom, I think about their generation mm. and how my mom, she used to walk down the streets in London and she would be the only hijabi, you know, like literally, even all of the Muslims in our area, hardly anyone wore hijab in those days. Yes. And she would be faced with racism, like to her face. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to like, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's so bad, it's kind of useful for us yeah. to see ourselves as having it bad. Yeah. Uh, when we compare it to, you know, what our moms had it like, you know, because Alhamdulillah, being a Muslim woman mm -hmm. and being a visibly Muslim woman is quite normal now, you know, like, so, so in that sense, Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of privilege in that sense right we've mm -hmm. we, we like subhanallah i just remember even just being in secondary school i was the only hijabi uh and you can see our school photo it's like everyone has short skirts everyone's rolled up their skirts right yeah <laughs> that's what everyone did and then there's my skirt the longest mm -hmm. <laughs> the long skirt girl with the white hijab you know so mm -hmm. as, as soon as you see our end of year photo you can just spot me straight away because you know, just stand out like that. And yet, a few years ago, when I was looking at secondary schools for my children, uh, I walked into one of the secondary schools in Barnet, which is the same area where I went to secondary school. And um, there was a massive image on the like, on the wall of the school, it's part of the school's branding, if you like, of a hijabi girl um, in, in a lab coat and, you know, doing science. And I just found that really emotional when I walked in there because I was like, wow, how things have changed, you know, yeah. <laughs> how things have I th changed. I think, Fatima, I think that is a very, mm. um, I think we overlook that. You're right. That yes. sometimes you need to look at the past and see how, what was it like to, for previous generations to then appreciate our situation now so alhamdulillah you're, you're right because I think I'm thinking back to when I again I didn't start wearing hijab at school I started wearing at college and I think I was this number this the second girl who, who put it on and okay. it and this but this what's interesting this was in a, I was in East London this was in a very Asian area okay, yeah. and you still got stared at as if what has possessed this girl is she yes. is she just she gone mad what what is she doing um, mm. And so you're right. Whereas now you can walk if in okay. In, in some areas, it probably still is you stand out. But as far as what does a Muslim woman look like, and yes, they wear hijab. That has people know that and don't balk at you. Um, 
So then if that, alhamdulillah, so okay, so, so then what would you then say is a challenge we face? Yeah, so, so I just wanted to like acknowledge that. Yeah, know, good. Um, because I think we should, you know, because it, it makes us grateful as well. And it makes us, yes. it, it, it sp- stops us from having a victimhood. Oh God, yes. Right? Oh, that word. <laughs> oh yeah. Because we, it's true. We, it's, it's so lovely being a victim. We can wallow in it. <laughs> It makes yeah, us, it's, oh. it's an excuse for everything, isn't it? Yeah, that's why. Right. Um, so, yeah, so, so bearing all of that in mind, um, there are some unique challenges. And the challenges are, I think, well, different generations will have different challenges, different age groups, I would say. Um, one of the challenges, especially for young people, is, you know, the challenge of social media and the constant barrage of images the constant especially for girls the constant call to be something that you're not you know to be Mm -hmm. an airbrushed version of yourself and uh, to fit a certain doll like barbie doll mode you know mold yeah and and I think that can have can have its uh, negative effect you know over time it, it really uh, damages people's self-esteem, especially girls. Mm-hmm. Um, if we thought we had it bad just from television and ads and, you know, the kind of images that are used against women yeah. uh, to kind of make them feel... Inadequate. Inadequate, uh, that they need to spend money, they need to, you know, buy yeah. more, they need to be consumers, they need to fix themselves mm-hmm. all the mm-hmm. time. And they're never good enough. If we thought it was bad, in the 80s 90s now it's like it's gone uh, high it's on, yeah, it's exactly. on steroids because yeah. because you literally like even even myself like just being on instagram for example i don't explore i don't browse instagram you know because yeah. i don't want to be confronted with images that are not good for my spiritual heart mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and that's the thing isn't it like images have an effect on your heart they have an immediate effect on your brain chemistry sometimes, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the idea of lowering your gaze is not just for um, the opposite sex. It's lowering your gaze from things that seek to stimulate you, titillate you, mm-hmm. or make you feel jealous or make yes. you feel anything, right? Anything kind of uh, attracted to the material world mm-hmm. in an unhealthy way. So I think the bombardment of, you know, images, girls being bombarded with images, Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the big challenges. And and even uh, women, I think you're right, it affects the young and the old because now everyone is now consuming this. It's global, Um, east and west. That's what's interesting. It's it's a global issue and Mm. um, and it's, and, and I think it's really interesting what you said about capitalism is and profit is these unscrupulous companies uh, they know exactly what they're doing they are they want women and and it's and it's part, increasing onto men and young boys as well that if we make people feel that they are um again inadequate or ugly or um not good enough it, the way that Allah's created them is not good enough then they will consume what we then provide because then here we go here's the cream here's the the clothes yeah. here's the plastic surgery that will make you a better person a more attractive the person. other day i think it was during uh, during lockdown uh you know the uh, the company estee louder mm-hmm. they sent out i'm on their mailing list so uh, they sent an email um with a hijabi influencer okay um saying that she's going to do a tutorial mm-hmm. and they're so clever like the way they worded it they they know that muslim women i mean it's like they sussed us out you know oh, yes. <laughs> like the way they worded it was you know the just the right look for the school run you know <laughs> <laughs> and i was thinking oh my god they're trying to make us feel inadequate on the school on run. The school <laughs> run yeah everyone looks Imagine inadequate sisters, on school my sister's like oh my god i better get my makeup on like I get my, school, my foundation on, on. <laughs> i don't want to be seen and whereas usually everyone's like in their pajamas or you know like yeah and just getting out of bed sort of thing yeah um 
and I just thought subhanallah how manipulative you know like it was yeah. so manipulative because it was like well you should be doing this you know aren't you doing this everyone's mm. doing it sort of yeah. thing right mm -hmm. um and that constant and and I think up to now we've been quite protected from that relatively you know there was this pride when we were growing up anyway there was this pride that you know as Muslim women we're not part of that constant mm. uh, obsession you know like without appearance yeah. and uh, you know anti-aging and you know all of that kind of obsession yeah um the commoditization of women of womanhood yeah. I would say right yeah we used to feel proud that we're not part of that mm. um but now it's almost like a lot of Muslim women have also been enticed into that and I think what that does is it leaves ultimately it leaves women feeling empty Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. because if all you're cultivating and all you're thinking about is appearances mm -hmm. you know that's a delusion that's like it's it's just a mirage yeah Very and temporary aging and you know the changes in our in our appearance in our lives are inevitable right mm -hmm. and if you're just cultivating your looks and you're constantly focused on that Think of all the areas that you're not cultivating, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The areas of your life that you should be, that, that will really bring you a lot of um, enrichment and uh, meaning, especially as you get older, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, because it's an interesting yeah. that if you're, I think the, um, you know, again, cultivating your mind and your, and your exactly. thinking and then your, um, your relationship with Allah, they are things that you don't mean to, but because you're putting your energy into, it's like they're telling us, this is what you should put your energy and time into. So you're, um, so you start doing that because you think that will give you happiness. Um, and then you end up neglecting those aspects because I, I think, and that's, that's, you know what you said about they've got in they really have got into our heads and it is yes. it's like we do have to protect our, our minds and our hearts yes. um, because they're the two things that will they affect us so much and so and I and I think that is a challenge that um protecting you know like don't not absorbing ideas that are alien to Islam so this whole idea of that oh you have agency and you're free and live life on your own terms but then guess what they're telling us the terms to live on we think we're choosing whether it's <laughs> yeah. our clothes our makeup our um even our career choices or what we're putting our energy into they're telling us this is what a woman yes. does this is what a, a a fierce strong independent woman does they're not obedient you know absolutely the and and that's why like subhanallah just yesterday a sister reached out reached out to me and she said that you know um when she just embarked on motherhood mm. uh she started having feelings of inadequacy oh and, gosh yes you know what i mean that whole kind of because of the devaluing of motherhood in mm -hmm. society yes and yes. the raising up of careerism as being the ultimate thing right mm. um a lot of sisters when the reality of life comes to them right which is mm which is actually the beauty of life which is that should be it should be that we're looking at it as like these are the things that are gonna like sustain you in your old age you know mm -hmm. family uh love yeah. relationships that mean something that you've really worked on that you've nurtured those things that should be valued because they're not being valued in society it can make sisters especially in that very vulnerable time when they just become a mother for example mm -hmm. and it is it is a shock isn't it it's like a, sh a shock to the system yeah um it can give them immense feelings of anxiety inadequacy I believe depression mm -hmm. and that's not natural it's like we've been manipulated into feeling like that yeah um, and this sister was telling me that she was listening to some of my talks over like from the past about motherhood in particular mm -hmm. and she said she just she realized that this was her calling and she really wanted to make it her calling and she wanted to see it as a project and she didn't just want to see it as like a side thing that you know that you do while you're doing your main thing sort mm. of thing right the way yeah, like a career break kind of, <laughs> yeah so um 
and and then she sort of she felt she said that she felt very empowered by that message you know that message that you're not just a mother stop saying I'm just a mum you know Mm -hmm. um so I think that's another challenge that Muslim women because we are still quite traditional right like the traditional role of of women uh the valued role of a mother, the valued role uh, as I would say matriarch of the family, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Muslim women still tend to tend to fulfill the, that role, but because society and the culture is constantly belittling that role mm-hmm. and those traditional roles, I think another challenge that Muslim women face is really sifting through the ideological. Uh, messaging that they're constantly being exposed to you know Mm -hmm. whether it's anti-men because I think that's another problem right Mm -hmm. there's a lot of anti-masculinity type messaging that we're exposed to Uh, my friend Naima B. Robert she was telling me she went to this um, marriage uh, talk for young people Mm -hmm. and I, I myself I've been engaging with teenage girls and one of the things you notice is that they have a very poor opinion of of men. You know, like oh gosh, the way they talk yeah. about You're boys so and right. men. Well, men are trash. That's the that's yeah. the saying. The men are trash thing. Yeah. And then there's this uh, toxic but, masculinity. Of yeah. Course. So Fatima, I think I think mm. there's an elephant in the room here, isn't it? It's feminism that feminism has now had such a massive impact on the thinking of all women and so when I yes. I now think we you know when it comes to Muslim women and I, I think just generally we have all absorbed certain ideas and, and, and feminism in particular it's interesting when you study it the history of it I, I spent yes. a good uh, over the past two years I've just been that's what I've been studying and oh, the excellent. impact has been phenomenal it's been so subtle and but it's been uh, it's been c- catastrophic for all women, like non-Muslim or Muslim, as in mm. it's like you're mentioning the uh, attitudes that women hold about motherhood. Let's go back even more into being the whole idea of singledom and why even why should you even get married? That's even being questioned. Uh, yes. That you know, stay remain single. Why do you need a man? Yeah, you can skip. You can get and go to education. You can study. You have money what's the need for a man who is trash at the end of the day and yes. but no one's saying men are perfect but hey guess what women aren't perfect either mm. that there's a lot out there that you know uh, we need to you're right let's rather than just blindly and passively take on the ideas that it then it's ultimately it's, it's progressive liberal culture that's being pushed to us and let's give us a mind let's question it let's push back mm. and say no hold on you're telling me to, that this is the blueprint for my life actually it's not why should i because the women women in not non-muslim women in the west they're not um, they're not happy and and i don't say this in a triumphant way that oh look yeah. us muslims we've got it and look at you nasty not no they're they their humanity islam came for all of humanity but what they're being given and they've taken it with the whole women's lib movement mm-hmm. well, now we're taking it and thinking that's better than what Allah's given us, but I think we have to really question it. Well, l- let me just make a comment about what you just said, because okay, I, I think one of the things that uh, sisters need to know is you can care about women's rights mm-hmm. without being a feminist. You know, you can care yeah. about women's rights. It's just like you can care about poverty without being a communist, right? Yes, you can. You can care about uh, being an entrepreneur and financial success without being a capitalist right yes you don't have to adopt an ideology and feminism today is an ideology right yeah. it's it's a set of ideas with which ideologues usually academics a lot of them um have come up with academics and human beings who know not really any much any, any more than we do you know what i mean like mm-hmm. it's, it's very much based on trial and error yeah theories right one of the theories very harmful theory that gender is like completely malleable completely fluid you know fluid uh the idea that it's just a construct you know there's nothing Mm. biological about us that that informs our our uh gender um and it's led to a lot of harm 
in the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s, there was this whole call anti-motherhood, anti-marriage call, right? Mm. Which basically made promiscuity acceptable, which yes. made, which was very harmful to women. Because mm. if you look at marriage and you label it as being slavery, which is what, you know, if you see the placards of the yeah. women's rights uh, protesters, it would say things like, you know, marriage is slavery and things like well, that. Well, it was Wollstonecraft who said um, marriage is a form of legal prostitution. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Can you see that? You see, what... taking, taking something that's so pure, mm. right, and just throwing it away, like without a thought. And, mm. and, and what has that done? It's meant that women are now expected, and we're talking about the wider society, women and girls, and I, I noticed this at school, they're mm. expected to do sexual favors for boys, yeah. to, um, to sleep with men, right? Mm. Without any kind of commitment, yeah. right? That's it. I mean, how and is that empowerment? That, yeah, that is liberation. You are being liberated right? when you do that. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the Me Too movement, if you look at a lot of the women coming forward, and the time period when they were abused and when they were harassed mm. is following that 60s and 70s, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and and continued, liberation. and it continued, yeah. Yes, and continues. But but do you know what I mean? Like when it was at its peak, I wouldn't say peak, but it seems like it's peak mm. when when it's almost like everyone was turning a blind eye, you know? Yeah. To it women became, being yeah. harassed. Yeah, I know. It's, you, you know, you think of... Um, that movie very famous movie nine to five where dolly parton gets harassed by her boss you know that that epitomized what was happening to women mm. i know it's you it's um i think it's as women um I, i'd say again all women if we look at it's really interesting when you look at our his the history of women's rights mm. and how in, in the west in particular like we can't deny that there were some things like for example you know equal pay for some not everyone because it still doesn't exist in the workplace you know again sexual harassment laws there were some things that uh, the feminist movement um gained for women so child care rights like the fact that they weren't given child care that you think they weren't seen as being worthy enough to be given those things and alhamdulillah humbler through their activism um certain rights were gained and okay and that, that's fair enough but it's the ideas that are so uh, this is it people need to look at the idea so this idea that somehow mm. or both gender there should be absolute equality and we should ignore the differences and like you said about that biology is just by the by that shouldn't dictate our roles in life or you know our choices right. and, and again and it's interesting this equality and pr promiscuity so people say that getting you know the pill legalized abortion um you know kind of abortion on demand to be honest and now with um, being able to change your gender, th these things come, these just sound, these all sound so good, but when you research them, you think they're not bringing women happiness. You know, the, no. the, the legal Women are suffering disproportionately yeah. Yeah. from like, all of these things. Like right? just an example, the fact that pornography is now, except that there's nothing wrong with pornography. Now, if you look at the amount of stuff, the, the, it's mainly women, but then, with this in the, the whole sex trade and, and the exploitation of women and and sex trafficking who is it affecting women that that freedom did not like as you said did not give women it's they're like they're in slavery now um and mm. that's muslim women and non-muslim women it's, it's all of us yeah so i think like whatever's happening in society around you it you know it infiltrates hmm. every community right to yeah. some extent so I think those are some of the challenges. Um, mm. And like I said, you can care about women's rights without falling prey to a particular ideology, you know, especially an ideology that you don't really know what the results of it will be, you know, mm -hmm. um, because as Muslims, we have our own framework, right? Mm -hmm. We have our own framework for women's rights. We have our own economic system. We have now those things it doesn't mean that Muslim societies are perfect, not at all. No. Oh my God, you know, I lived in Egypt. <laughs> oh gosh. You know, sexual harassment in Egypt is rife. Yeah. That's yeah. not, that's because people 
have moved away from Islam. Mm -hmm. It's because people are not being uh, nurtured with taqwa, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, and so, of course, those need to be tackled, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about saying, let's ignore, you know, the negative things in our communities. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. We will deal with them. But we won't allow an ideology to dictate to us uh, especially one that is based on trial and error, mm. based on, you know, ideologies that... And based on the human mind. At the end of the day, mm. fe feminism grew out of liberalism. It's a, it's a branch yes. of liberalism. And who, John Locke, my goodness, he, why, you know, he's just because of his understanding of his right, the rights, it's certain, down, you know, in, we have certain rights and that's just been taken. Like the rights thought of by this old white man who... <laughs> And he, it's been taken and, and taken as gospel. And suddenly, you know, uh, it, that, that's, it, that is actually quite amazing that how that is being given to us as a blueprint. Um, but now going back to your, you're right, that we do have our, um, so Islam, you know, it's given rights to women. But I think now this is another challenge that I'm seeing a lot, that Muslim, the Muslim women that I'm speaking to through my podcast, um, and, um, and one of the reasons why I wrote the book about, I've, I've written a book, it's called Smart Single Muslima, which looks at all the issues, that, the, the, the kind of hurdles that are put in the way for Muslim women to get made, uh, whether that's racism, individualism, feminism, um, you know, things like that. The, the thing that I keep hearing repeatedly is that, yeah, but look at our Muslim communities look how they're not following Islam or they are being racist or they have colorism or they mm. have misogyny. And it's so hard to then, uh, like I'm, I'm trying, when I speak to women and I'm, I'm telling them, yeah, Islam is the answer. And they're saying, but I don't see it in the Muslim men and women or in my communities. That I think mm. it, that's a challenge that we face. How do we, um, and I think Ahamda, we have a lot of work to do and um, yes. because I'm definitely not one to blame. I think um, liberal society is causing problems for us, but we are then, because we are not, we are choosing to disobey Allah as a community wise, that is then causing us problems. We can't expect yeah. the fruit of, you know, our, you know, our duas to be answered when we're choosing to disobey our creator. I, that's something we really yeah. have to like internalize. Yeah, well, I think one of the, like, uh, I've been studying human rights law recently, and one of the key differences between our, the Muslim, the Islamic approach to mm -hmm. rights and human, human rights, mm -hmm. um, and the Western approach mm -hmm. <clears throat> is individualism, isn't it? Oh, yes. Uh, so, and then that comes from liberalism, right? So the whole idea that the individual and the individual's happiness, the individual's freedom, the individual's everything, autonomy is king right mm -hmm. uh, for us as muslims the individual is important but god is the most important right yes so our desires our you know uh, even our rationale you know is subservient to god mm. now and and that means that it's much more holistic because god as the creator knows what's best for us mm -hmm. um and he doesn't ask us to only take care of the rights and the feelings of the individual. Mm -hmm. We take, we are told, and our Sharia takes into account the effects on the family, the effects mm -hmm. on the couple, you know, together. So men and women, we are interdependent. We're not, we don't, it doesn't need to be this clash. There doesn't need no. to be this competition, this constant pitting of men and women against each other. Mm -hmm. um, we should be cooperative you know and that's i think the the way things have been through most of history right mm -hmm. um and so so it's a much more holistic way of looking at the world you know mm -hmm. uh, where it's not just about the rights of the individual no matter what happens right like no matter what the effect on the unborn child is for example no matter mm -hmm. what the effect on the family is or on wider society is and the morals of society you know Mm -hmm. um, Islam takes into account all of these things. And we have, for example, the, oops, <laughs> sorry, I'll say that again. <laughs> Fatima, can I just, I turned my heater yeah. on. Could you hear it? 
In fact, I'm just no. going to turn my fan on again because my this room's, <laughs> it's gone really cold. Can, can you hear the fan? I can't, but it might be because I haven't got the volume up very high. Let me put the volume up higher. No? Personally, I can't, but okay. I, don't know. I haven't got just, headphones on, so. Oh, okay. All right, I'll, I'll turn it off just in case, because oh, it's actually gone really cold. Have I got my... Yeah, I've forgotten what I was saying, but... Um, you, you were talking about um, how in liberalism, it gives individual is the most, is given the highest position. And whereas in Islam, Allah, we are we are the slaves, I suppose. And, and Allah tells... Yes. So, yeah, that all came so through. Okay, Islam yeah. it all into account, the entirety of, and, and, and not only does Islam take into account our dunya, right? Mm, That's yes. another important thing, right? Because mm. human rights and a lot of like liberalism, etc. Mm. It's all about this world, right? It's all about yeah. your there is, yeah. world. But for us, it's beyond this world, right? This world is just a short amount of time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about what's good for your hereafter as well. So when we've got that type of framework that's so holistic, hmm. I think the thing that we as women, once I believe women are empowered enough and uh, aware enough, awakened to the fact that we are the culture makers of society, you know? Hmm. I know it's a cliche, but it's true that, you know, Muslim women are half of the ummah and we raise the other half. Mm -hmm. What that means is we have the ability to change the culture of the ummah. If there's mm -hmm. something that we're seeing that's become a norm in society, in our own community, mm -hmm. and we want to change that, we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's not going to be overnight. You know, we have mm -hmm. to take the long view. Okay, mm -hmm. but as the mothers, as the as the uh, culture makers, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, we as women have a huge amount of uh, influence. Yes. Yeah. If we want to look at it like that. Yeah, you know? this is so, right. We should see that because mm -hmm. if we think, you know, um, as mothers or, or even, okay, even if you're not a mother, that yeah. um, amongst the women that... Um, let's like I was let's take the example of racism when it comes to marriage because this is something I feel is quite a big... I see in the South Asian community that you'll have young women who say, who they, they can't get married, but they're told you can only marry, let's say you can only marry Pakistani, that, that's my background, so that's what I know about. And then therefore, it's, and it's narrowed down even more, okay, particular families, particular caste, and, and then that girl can then, it's like mission impossible to get married. Now, if the mothers, let's say for example, the mothers, the aunties, the older sisters, they decide, no, you know what, we're gonna accept that allow, let's have a culture where we allow our daughters to marry an Arab or an African or any Muslim of any colour or any background and they push it because you're right they do have a lot of power there and that that's how things can change you know once upon a time arranged forced marriages is what would happen a lot but that culture has been changed that's become unacceptable and I do yeah. think in the home we do underestimate the power of women in a positive you know when I say power yeah, as I mean absolutely. ability you know we we you're right I love that idea that you're saying we can define the culture in our homes and yes. um, you know and we change and, society one home at a time right yeah that that's right that that because again it's in you can you know the the hadith about um I'm only paraphrasing that you know if you see an evil you can you can change it with your hand you can speak out yes. against it or you can hate it with your heart within, we should look at our capability and our sphere of influence and think, what can I change? You know, sometimes yes. we look at the big problems and Alhamdulillah, we should, we do the yes. while, we give charity, we, where we can, we look at big, but in our homes, let's work on our homes. Let's work on our extended family. We yes. can do a lot. Absolutely. And sometimes we overlook that hmm. and we want to do revolutionary things, you know, that yes. we don't necessarily have influence on. Yeah, uh, but it really does start with you. It starts with you being a role model, and then it starts with your family, and then it it kind of, you know, yeah, it, it grows. Yeah, yeah, it it definitely effect. grows. And I think the other thing is that, look, 
don't underestimate the transformative power of Islam because mm. if you think about the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it was a it was a society that used to bury its daughters alive, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot, like, right? When the little baby, Allah revealed that when the little baby girl who's been buried alive will ask for what crime was she killed? And with that ayah and with the Quran, within 20 years, within a decade or two, the entirety of Arabia was free of female infanticide. Female infanticide wasn't part of their culture anymore, mm-hmm. right? So that's the transformative power of the Quran. When mm-hmm. people internalize it, when people accept yeah. it, they decide that they're going to you know, follow its mm-hmm. guidance. And today we have societies like India, China, where female infanticide is rife. Mm-hmm. You know? It doesn't matter how many UN resolutions and UN uh, treaties are <laughs> kind of... Yeah, you know, they, yeah, they have... Uh, does, uh, this new one effect. yeah Doesn't but i think we effect. i think we also have to take into account that you're right that there's the individual the society and then it's also when when the quran is practiced as law that when it is you know not only was it prohibited but you would then get punished if you if you would bury your daughter so you could no longer the people who chose were choosing actually i'd still like to do it they can't do it anymore because that's the other thing that um, you know, back then, uh, so that all the laws relating to women that came about, that gave us the rights that Allah, Allah chose for us, you now then had the power of the Sharia being implemented oh, as well. Yeah. That so any, and this is, I think, a consequence. You mean there was a exactly consequence. that they knew. Okay, if they're not going to, I still want to be oppress my my daughter, my wife, my whoever. They knew. Oh, now I'm gonna not, I'm gonna get in trouble with the <laughs> with yeah. the judge, with the courts. Oh, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, that's the thing uh, that we're missing. But alhamdulillah, that doesn't mean we st- we just think, oh, okay, it's not there, so we're going to leave it. We still have to do something, yeah? Um, mm-hmm. And I think in particular, don't try borrowing solutions from uh, uh, un-Islamic cultures. They won't help us. Uh, even. The- but then I think, I think going back to, this is the thing many women do look to, um, whether it's um, campaigns or protests or activism that, um, again, is it feminist, feminist in nature, because they think, well, the Muslims aren't talking about um, domestic violence, what they, you know, or they're not speaking about, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the mistreatment of women or even the sexual harassment, for example, yeah. the Muslims aren't these are the, the concerns I have that I'm dealing with right now. Mm. The most are the are the most just talking about it. Are Islamic organisations do, doing anything to help me? They're not. So I'm going to turn to non-Muslims who are willing to help me. I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's, we are told that we should do ta'awun, right? When it comes to good things. So mm. if there are certain causes, certain things that we can collaborate with and that, that are in line with our values, Mm-hmm. and our uh, convictions and of course you know we can get involved with that and we should mm-hmm. where it becomes problematic is then when we hook line and sinker start adopting another ideology right mm-hmm. uh, or we start allowing it to affect the way we look at things so i guess one of the things that we try to do so let me just give you a bit of background about the conference so yes uh a few years ago, we held the Seeds of Change conference a number of years in a row, and it was the largest Muslim women's conference in Europe. We had women coming from, we were quite surprised, actually, we had to open up more seats, you know, oh, uh, because so many Muslim women wanted to come. And it was really a call to action to Muslim women to really uh, own their identity as Muslim women, to realize the immense privilege and uh, you know gift that they had in Islam and then to use that to affect their communities to make da'wah basically to their communities right so the Mm -hmm. organization that ran the conference uh, was a da'wah organization right da'wah to non-Muslims in particular so what we found is 2,000 women came uh, they and this these are paid tickets you know so it was a big deal like people were coming from Indonesia and you know places that we didn't realize and that's the wonder of the internet now right you can reach 
the world. And the overwhelming feeling that they had, and by the way, we, we crafted the conference. It wasn't, for us, it wasn't just a bunch of talks, you know, like people just, mm. let's just get so-and-so big names and just get them to do a talk. It wasn't like yeah. that. It was a journey. We, we had actually designed it, you know, so that the moment that the sisters walked in to the moment when they left, they had been taken on, I would say, they'd been taken on a journey, a mental journey, a spiritual journey, you know? Um, and so by the end of it, we had women who were brimming full of positivity. Uh, by the way, we had a whole women, mothers section as well. So Mashallah. mothers with babies were there. It wasn't, it was very inclusive in that sense. We obviously like, cause we're women, we cared about women, right? Mm. We cared about their needs. We, yeah. we tried. Uh, and we made it a beautiful place as well. We made sure it was like a nice hotel. It was sisters nice, felt like nice food. Yes, in China. I, so. <laughs> I don't remember what the food was. <laughs> I hope there were cakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were some stalls. But the point is that it was like a day out for the sisters. Oh, Marshall, that was lovely. But myself and my team, uh, especially the sister who's like uh, who was managing the event, we really believe in the transformative power of a day you know mm -hmm. like because we in our own lives I think we've had conferences or events that we've been to that took us on a journey and changed our life you know like I know people think you know no oh, it's just an iman boost blah 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 yeah there are those types of conferences but then there are conferences where you leave with a new sense of purpose mm. you know and so having experienced that and then hearing the feedback from the sisters, they were like, yeah, we just set up a group in our community. We like, sometimes it was small things like we set up a knitting group in our community and, you know, we've got non-Muslim women coming and we've been having conversations about Islam. Hmm. It was all Dawa related, right? Yeah, wonderful. Um, but it was sort of like activating the sisters in, in a very positive way. And, you know, I always say, uh, I think it's a saying, uh, I think it's attributed to Gandhi or Nelson Mandela. It's always one of them, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's uh, that if you want to kind of, if you want, if you want to stop having problems of your own, find a bigger problem, right? Okay. Find a bigger problem to deal with. Yeah. When you have a bigger problem, then your little petty issues <laughs> kind of pale into insignificance and you, you're able to focus on something greater, something more meaningful. And I think that was one of the things that the conference and the messages that we were trying to give sisters did. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately the conference uh, after a number of uh, runs couldn't carry on because um, the organization that was basically funding it and supporting us they um you know changed their strategy they had a different they wanted to go in a different direction i see but we were left feeling like wow we've just tasted what sisters want you know we we know what sisters want mm -hmm. and this is one of those things they want connectedness with their fe fellow sisters yeah. they want messages that are specific to them yeah um also Another catalyst, I think, that really made me feel that there's a need for a Muslim women's organization mm -hmm. was there was a, a Muslim women's, it was an event, big event, very advertised. It, it happens, and I don't know if it's annual, but anyway, and I was invited as a speaker mm -hmm. and very glamorous, very nice. But when myself and some others went, to it we saw okay this event is all about fashion yeah uh, that <laughs> when we entered the bazaar or the kind of convention area uh there were plastic surgeons <laughs> okay mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. this was called muslim you know oh, yeah. it was labeled muslim women yeah yeah so we we were like okay you know and it was all materialism you know mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with fashion. I love fashion, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I love jewelry. I love all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. But when an event is only about that stuff, mm -hmm. okay, 
and only about how you can look sexy in your hijab and all that mm-hmm. kind of thing, right? Yeah. And then you're inviting me to be the little Islamic. <laughs> yeah, you're going to give the blessing. You're going to yeah. bless everyone. Make it, so, make it gotta, feel good and halal about this. You've got to start the event with a bit of Quran. Oh, right? yeah. Yes, okay. That that will legitimise everything, <laughs> basically. Yeah, um, did, did people put napkins on their heads? <laughs> well, then, yes, I think so. And then you have me as like the, I don't know, the warm up who kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed you're to the- make everyone feel like they're all okay, you know? Yeah. Um, I just realized, oh my God, I don't want to be part of legitimizing this as the norm. And, and yet there's no alternative. Like, oh yes. That's you see right. what I mean? Like, that's it. Is, so sisters think, well, this, we want a day out. We want to meet sisters. We want to mm. go to something that's tailored for Muslim women. Yeah. And this is what's on offer. So let's go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That is, this is so, Fatima, you have hit the nail. I was feeling this so much when I, I used to do events when I used to, I, I have business in it and I used to do, I, I used to did every single Muslim event for 10 years ago, going to, and I used to have my stall mm. and, and it was oh, a made yeah. the the change in from the events used to be very Islamic and there'd be talks and very, Islam was very important to the last one that I went attended and I decided I can't do this anymore because slap bang in the middle was a catwalk and we were there at the setting up and I saw them setting up and you know you have like the woman screaming at the models move it shake it come on give me some of this give me and I was just thinking oh my what is this is modest fashion this is the what is being offered to Muslim women and you're Mm. right and there was the whole thing it just I thought I don't think I can be part of this anymore because this version of Islam this progressive liberal uh, kind of uh, it was like a weird mix of um okay so there's some halal food but you're right there's a woman there's what's women wearing, uh, if it's modest fashion, I don't know what it is. And then you've got, and then what I didn't like was there were like influencers going around trying to get you to give me free stuff and I'll take a photo in front of your stall and put it on Instagram. And I thought, I feel like I'm being mugged. Um, It was the whole thing. And and what was the the cherry on the cake was one brother said, I decided to do a dan. And he did a dan and the organizers came and told him to stop what yeah okay. and and he said what do you mean and then he said i'm doing a dance so everyone can we can play in jamaat because it was a prayer area and the um the organizer he did muslim organizer he's saying it was because he was saying allahu akbar and oh. uh he goes I don't, and then wouldn't, other, wouldn't the go other, with that image probably yeah it didn't and the other then just your normal muslims were saying no let him do the adhan because we're going to pray now and yeah. i thought look at where we've come and you're right and there's no alternative yeah um, so so anyway these are the sorts of feelings you know that, that yeah. I, I realized you know what there's a lack of female leadership in that sense you know mm-hmm. there's a lack of there are women who are entrepreneurial and you know don't get me wrong I think Muslim women are so talented you know mm-hmm. I'm so proud like even just hearing about you and, and just seeing your podcast I feel so proud of you I feel so proud of our sisters you know I feel like there's so much good in our community but I feel like there's a lack of attention for women mm. towards women so like typically the uh organizations the Dawah organizations and the Islamic organizations are run by men that's fine you know I'm not mm-hmm. criticizing that at all yeah. and a lot of sisters work for those as well but I think because they've got so many other concerns that they're dealing with you know so yeah. many other concerns their net is so wide that they can't focus on the needs of women, you know, Mm -hmm. specific messaging for sisters, Mm -hmm. right? So whenever there's some kind of crisis, um, sisters are feeling low because some politicians are targeting them or, you know, they're being made fun of or um, the media has gone after them, right? Or Mm. some law that's been passed against the hijab yeah yeah so like yeah whenever those things happen I feel like there's a there's a response but you know I really feel for the sister who's at home who Mm. just feels really attacked and feels really like nobody's speaking for her nobody yeah there's no group that she can turn to Mm -hmm. you know 
to see some leadership, to see some um, some action, and yeah. and also to, to kind of rejuvenate her, hmm. to give her a sense of resilience. I think resilience is my word. You know, mm-hmm. I want our sisters to feel resilient despite the Islamophobia and the attacks, you know? Yeah, yeah, a way to deal confidently and Islamically with what the challenges that are being thrown at them. Because it's interesting that mm. there, there have been books like um, written by Muslim women, like uh, a number of different authors will get together and write about that. this issue that you're saying that when these things happen, there've been books that yeah. have been written and have got a lot of attention. But when you read them, and even like, uh, again, I've, I've listened to a lot of podcasts by Muslim women um, and, and read books by Muslim women. And the way that what I find lacking is that the Islam isn't at the forefront of the solution that they're giving to Muslim women. It, they seem to be either saying, OK, any lifestyle a Muslim woman wants to cho- choose is OK. It's, uh, you know, whatever voice, whatever a Muslim woman is saying is OK. It's her life. It's her choice. But the thing is that that's taking away, no, we, we, we're slaves to Allah, that even what the way we're going to deal with the problems we're facing, it has to be within the framework of Islam. So we don't right. just, um, so whether it's the hijab ban for the under, you know, the under 18s in France, are we going to say, no, it's, it's our freedom. Are we going to use the freedom argument and the liberty argument to explain this? Or are we going to talk about how, no, it's, an, it's a matter of obedience. It's an Islamic obligation that we yeah. want to continue. It's not about freedom. It's about obligation. And um, Like and, we and, might have to invoke freedom. We might have to invoke it mm-hmm. as a way to say to the West, for example, you know, Western leaders that, look, your treaties, your human rights treaties that you've signed up to say mm-hmm that I'm allowed to express my right. okay. freedom of religion, right? Yeah. So we might have to invoke it mm. in order to get our rights, mm-hmm. right? But that sh- that's not our reason for doing it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Well, so, yeah, pointing yeah. out their hypocrisy, mm. because yes. it does show the hypocrisy in their law that they're, they're selectively choosing when to apply their laws. I want our sisters to know that it is out of love for mm-hmm. them. Yeah. And out of wanting the best for them for their dunya and akhirah mm-hmm. um that i am fearful you know yeah yeah and I'm i think yeah that i that i think that led yeah. into a tunnel that is ultimately going to harm them hmm. and at the end of the day when we say islam islam what are we saying what we're actually saying we're not saying you know what we're saying is our creator right yes our creator when he has given us guidelines or when he's prohibited something it's because there's something harmful in that Hmm. he's commanded us with something there's something good in it whether we can rationalize it or not whether we can see the good in it or not right now Mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. one day we will yeah um but it's there right Mm -hmm. so once you realize that you realize that oh i don't have to figure everything out for myself (laughs) you know um and i shouldn't let go of my I shouldn't give anyone else so much power that they get to dictate to me how I should live my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, my Lord has sent me guidance, right? Mm. The guidance is there and it's so broad as well. You know, it's not, it's not a straight jacket. It's, mm. subhanallah, you know, the Sharia is so kind of flexible. It has flexibility in it, you know, a certain amount of flexibility, enough flexibility it has the ability to span cultures, to span time, you know? Mm. So we've got this amazing gift that is Islam. Mm-hmm. Allah said, you are the best nation that has been extracted from mankind, for mankind. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you enjoin the good, you forbid the evil, and you believe in Allah. Mm-hmm. And so when we were doing our conference, you know, one of our, our tagline was, be the best of womankind. Right. It was literally that we as Muslim women, we should be so, we should be women of substance, you know, mm-hmm. not women who can just be swayed by whatever the latest fad is, whatever the latest trend is, whatever the latest kind of, uh, you know, pressure is on women. Mm. We've got to be more critical, you know, like more critical yes. thinking and scrutinizing 
mm. and observant of what's really going on you know yeah and I think and I think so you know with the academy then tell me a bit more about the academy because what the, to, to be able to be critical in your thinking you need knowledge you need yeah. access to knowledge uh, as well so t tell me about the academy so so I think there are three areas that we've so far identified so we, we are still in the early stages of our organization and we're going we're trying to go through it in a very good way you know like in a very to strategic way mm -hmm. uh, and having uh, professional facilitators help us with every stage alhamdulillah mm -hmm. uh, because we want to do things properly and also yeah. because we've all of us have been involved in lots of organizations and we've seen some of the mistakes that have been made yeah. and we don't want to have to go through all of that right mm -hmm. so of course i'm not saying we're not going to make mistakes but we'd like to do things properly from the beginning so the three areas I think we've really identified that uh, we would like to serve women in is our motivation in terms of their motivation and you know uh, commitment to deen in that sense right uh, the other is fortification so their sense of being strengthened from within and uh, resilience you know so whatever's being thrown at them Mm -hmm. whether it's the tests of life or whether it's the islamophobia you know mm -hmm. um, muslim women have the spiritual resilience to deal with that you know mm -hmm. um, and then the third is knowledge and education mm -hmm. because um, i think those three things are quite important you know in tandem uh, and so and so with education we we feel that there's definitely got to be in any effective Muslim women's organization that tries to address the needs of you know Muslim women en masse it, it, we've got to have an education aspect mm -hmm. and also because I think from my own experience you know uh, since I was 16 I've been studying Arabic I've been um, studying right. and I know the transformative power of even something as simple as studying the seerah right mm -hmm. you know from beginning to end it will change your life yes um, because every type of character <laughs> that you meet in life I, the prophet <laughs> Sira has in it right yeah and every pain and every difficulty you can see something in it for you you know mm. um so yeah so well, i'm i'm very excited about um the uh, the knowledge part that because i think this is i think this is so key that <clears throat> that women can't for various reasons women do not have as much access to knowledge or whether it's through the masjid or through its classes and we really need to start being able to le learn our deen more that um yes. that has to be the beginning and then we will be more confident we'll be better i actually think whether it's better individuals better wives better mothers just be better in everything whatever we choose to do but we need that knowledge like i'm thinking it took me so long to be able to find a class a women's yeah. only class you know because then there yeah. were certain questions you just only want to ask in front of a woman you know there's certain topics you don't feel comfortable speaking about it in front of a man and so to have access to knowledgeable sisters you know so so are you saying it would be courses that you could take and maybe would it be i know it, actually it's just at the beginning so i guess yeah. i'm sure you've got um i think All that the kind of extra. details i would say yeah. we are still working them yes, out of yes. course of course but i think i guess what i'm uh sharing with people now is hmm. our thinking right yes. our, our thinking and we would love you to help us formulate out what their needs are right mm -hmm. but at the very least we need an organization that is focused on that right yeah don't you, have know, that you know for example like one of the things that i think is really needed is that you know there are certain um there are certain points a certain topics that are taken and um misrepresented and used to beat islam and muslim women over the head with so to show so for example things like um the age of aisha may i be pleased with her that's seen as uh, it's thrown at us and said look at how a stuff like you know it, it's disgusting your religion is it allows this or um uh, female circumcision polygamy again domestic the men can beat their wives 
you know, um, the idea of secret marriages or there's certain things, you know, that uh, the idea of that men will go to heaven and get, you know, um, female hoodies and women will get nothing. These are things that are uh, which, are all, which are not true, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you for saying that. But these are <laughs> things that they misrepresent, misquote, but they're put on YouTube videos are made about it, documentaries, articles are written by non-Muslims, and that creates doubts in the minds of Muslim right. women who don't have, like, I've had, I used to be That's high school. That's another school. big challenge. You know, you know when yeah. you asked me yeah. at the beginning of this session, like, what are the challenges? I was thinking, where do we start? You know, I know, <laughs> like, you're right. There were so many. I started with Instagram, but <laughs> yeah. in my mind, I was thinking, yeah, but then there's that. But then there's yeah, that. Yeah, there you, are. You and just I highlighted think, another I, very big thing, which yeah, is... And, and, and I think in the, in your knowledge section, doing things that specifically address those things Definitely, that yeah. a woman, a young woman or any woman, she can't go and ask. She feels if I ask these things, does it sound like I'm, I am don't have faith? Does it seem like I'm questioning yeah. my dean? No, you're not. You you can ask these questions, but who do you ask and who do you get answers yeah. from? Um, Absolutely. And, and this is why the reason why I'm sighing is because. <laughs> I feel like there's a mountain in front of me. Yeah, you know? I'm love it. And, um, and uh, there's so much to do. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we've got to get started. Yes, you know? you're right. And that's why we've got this campaign. Let me just mention the... Oh, yes, the, sorry, the please mention the well. campaign. <laughs> so our vision, the vision that we've formulated is every woman holding firm to the rope of Allah. And there's a lot of thought that's gone into that vision. Inshallah, I will be articulating it in the future. But... Uh, for us, it's about focusing on women, and it's not just Muslim women. We would mm. love to focus on non-Muslim women as well. We've done, um, like some of us uh, were involved in a Dawa project where we actually invited non-Muslim women to an event with their Muslim friend, right? And we had beautiful food, you know, it was like a, a Dawat, right? It was like a, mm. <laughs> a dinner. In a, in a nice hall um, and then there was a presentation about Islam about Muslim women and we did it in a very uh, it was done in a very innovative way you know yeah so for example there was an image of a woman put on the screen without her hijab and the sister in her niqab who was standing there presenting mm -hmm. it was her right oh okay and okay. they said you know, do you think this woman is in this room right because she was looking beautiful, right? Because it was women's only, we could do that, you know? Yeah. And then the women were like really shocked when they found out that this sister was the, <laughs> was mm. that. And immediately there was a shift, right? There's a shift yeah. like, oh, like there's a side of these women we don't get to see, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the bigger aim is to reach women, full stop. Mm. Don't you think for her that, although like we talk about feminism, blah, 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 we care about women, you know? Oh, like, definitely. I, I yeah. want women to be happy. Yeah, and I feel sad when I see the type of the 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 conditioning, the exploitation, yeah. the commodification of women, and to be honest, I would call it grooming. The grooming yeah. of women, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why I call it grooming is I, I went to girls' school. Mm. I, I I'll tell you, the girls were groomed. Oh yeah, hundred percent, they were groomed. You know, mm. the fact that they felt that they had to go behind the sheds or wherever they went and gives favors to boys. Uh, mm. The fact that they felt that they had to have a boyfriend and if they yeah. didn't, then they would be made fun of, mm. you know? Um, yeah. All of that stuff, mm. it's a type of grooming. Yeah. It's grooming girls to be available for men, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's happening in plain sight. Yeah, it is. And no one, no one is saying anything about it. They've, they've packaged it in liberation and uh, an uh, agency. You know, I used to be a high school teacher. And what you're saying, I used to see my students, it was again, mixed schools. And I, my, I used to feel so protective of these girls that yeah. you'd see them coming in in year seven, and then by year eight, year nine, they had changed into uh, uh they were unrecognizable and i remember the ma the amount of ma like uh, they used to the way they used to get ready in break time and i'd be there and i want to say to them you don't have to do this but you know they're, they're straightening their hair they're sorting out their makeup they're again pulling their skirts up pulling their blouses down 
And I just thought, subhanAllah, this, I did, you're right. So we don't have this, you know, let's get our boxing gloves out and bash the non-Muslim women. We're not into that. We care about them. I, I care about womanhood and women. Mm. And I believe that we as a Muslim community should be so strong, us mm. women should be so strong that we're bringing Islam as the solution to the wider community, right? Mm -hmm. But at the moment, we're so defensive. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're just always in defense mode. And mm. it's almost like we're ghettoizing ourselves even further yes. by being like, you know, by labeling people. And subhanAllah, most people are just a product of their conditioning, right? Mm. Yeah. And society is conditioning people to think a certain way. And us as Muslims, our job is to uh, be so enlightened, enlightened and have so much conviction in our own deen mm. uh, that we can now bring the light to others. Yes. And so that's the ultimate vision, you know, that yeah, alhamdulillah. we're strengthened to such an extent that we then forget about being, in, you know, introspective and constantly just looking at ourselves and what's going on and how everyone else is Islamophobic. That's not the point. The point is, most of society are not Islamophobic. I don't yeah. believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe most of society are human beings looking for the right way. And they just fall into line with whatever they've been conditioned to do, right? Yeah. I would say that's the same for the girls at school that I grew up with, you know, that it was the only way shown to them. Yeah, that's it. The only way that's shown to you is that way. And we as Muslims are not showing the alternative. Yeah. Right? In, a, in an eloquent way. Mm -hmm. And don't you feel, I think for women, for us in the West, where we have materially, we're okay, you know, alhamdulillah, we're not having to think about where's our food coming from, where's our water come from. So again, I, I feel this um, uh, responsibility quite uh, heavy on my shoulders that when, alhamdulillah, when Allah's given me so much ease, I then, I should do something for, not because I'm amazing or, you know, it's, you know, in your, again, in this privileged situation, we can do something. May our sisters in, really? in India and Yemen and, and China, and, you know, they can't do things, but we have a voice and we, so we should use it. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because I think there were two things. One, I realized how amazingly unlikely it is that I'm a Londoner and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I was born in London and brought up in London. You know, when I talked to my dad and the story of how he came to London, yeah. I realized how unlikely it is that mm. we would like it's almost as though the universe conspired yeah to get you ended here. up where you are yeah right? and then another incident that happened to me was when we went to, when I went to Jerusalem and my friends who were not British and not American mm -hmm. they got turned away ah oh, right and us Brits and Americans didn't matter what skin color we were you know yeah. we got had the passport. right in right yeah. And I realized at that point, what right do I have to, to think of myself as anything but privileged, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so from that privileged position, and, and just think about this, the fact that we speak English. Hmm. English is the lingua frank franca of the world, right? Mm -hmm. It is the language of the world now. It yeah. is the language. <clears throat> How unlikely is it that, you know, Allah put us in that position, right? Mm -hmm. That we are native English speakers. So bearing all of that in mind, I definitely think we've got a huge responsibility. Mm, yeah. Definitely got a huge responsibility. Um, so I want to uh, bring this vision to fruition. Um, and I believe now some people might say, well, why just women? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, my answer to that is, uh, I think every organization has to take, has to have a bit of focus, you know, <laughs> like you can't. Of course, yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, that's, that's one thing. But the other thing is, I think that throughout history, we can see that even during colonialist times, the colonialists understood that the fastest way to change a community and a society is to focus on women. Mm. That's why when you look at the French in Algeria, and I oh, think yes. today as well, I think today as well, the reason why so much pressure is put on Muslim women in France, for example, Mm -hmm. and in, certain, uh, in the western world in general is because if the muslim woman and her commitment to islam can be broken right mm. then the entire society the entire community is assimilated yeah. yes 
that's true right? that's so true. the quickest way it's the quickest way because the attitudes of the mother the attitudes of the women you know they feed into the next generation of men mm. and right yeah that's why i believe that by focusing on women <clears throat> and making sure that women are not neglected their doubts their issues their whatever questions are not left um unanswered mm. right adequately uh, mm -hmm. by doing that inshallah we're going to have a generation of women who are resilient who are strong who are committed mm -hmm. enough to sustain the community and to you know to bring about positive change in the mm -hmm. fastest way so for me that's really um that's really it and and we hope to do that inshallah through a number of means mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, we ha we do at this stage. We're doing some fundraising during Ramadan mm -hmm. for the stage, and so we have a page launchgood.com slash Muslim women dot com slash Muslim women, and you know we we're hoping that sisters are and brothers are going to support us mm -hmm. because they see that you know that this is needed. Um, there's one other area I really want to share with you because, by the way, I'm so happy to be speaking to you. Like, I feel like you're an old friend. I don't oh, think we've ever spoken, we've spoken right? No, no. Exactly. So um, another thing, and I don't know if you've noticed, because I, I didn't know that you've, mashallah, you're, you're quite, you're a knowledgeable person, you're, you've studied, right? Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, at university, like being a mature student, I'm, I'm doing my MA, right? And, um, Alhamdulillah. The, being back at the uni, in the uni space. Oh, yes. I've um, been observing certain things, right? Mm -hmm. And this was another catalyst, I would say, right? Yeah. For this. Um, so studying women's rights, human rights and Islamic law, etc. One of the things you realize is that in the entire women's rights space in relation to Islam is completely dominated with voices that are anti-Islam, right? Oh, yes. Or voices that are anti-normative Islam, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they, they'll say that they're Muslims and etc. right? That's, but when you scrutinize it, they're actually trying to change Islam. Or they're, yeah, they, they want to reform. They, they have a very reformist agenda. Yeah, and the reform is not good reform you know yeah. it's not like reforming the community or reforming the society mm. sometimes it's literally ideological reform yeah well Rather it's interesting that, again they've taken their um cues from liberal thought that right. religion you know christianity accepted secularism and then and the whole reformation and the enlightenment they want us to have go through that go through same that. process that christianity did and we will come out enlightened and we will leave uh, we'll stop obeying Allah so so you know adamantly and and be more flexible be more progressive but what I was surprised with is in other areas of Islamic law or Islamic studies right there are multiple voices okay mm. like you know the readings that you get mm -hmm. read, like, for each area even something like Islamic finance for example mm. there are different voices there are liberal voices and there mm. are conservative voices and you know, in the middle, kind of what I call pragmatist voices, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to women's rights, yes. it's like the, in terms of the academic literature, yeah, it's completely dominated with voices that are literally saying orthodoxy, Islam, when yeah. I say orthodoxy, I mean, you know, classical. Uh, or, yeah, just, just following Quran and, and Sunnah, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, that has got to go right that's basically yeah. the narrative that's all got to go it's all got to be re-looked at because it's, it's because men wrote men interpreted the quran and yeah. so again and feminist, ideology, right? yeah. feminist ideology men can never be just you know? yeah yeah <laughs> is it possible because men because be they're trash ultimately right and uh, it's impossible for men to have ever been just towards women. Yeah. And it's all, uh, everything's been interpreted through a male lens. Mm -hmm. And men are always biased. And, you know, yeah, that yeah. Kind of and women, and women are not, never biased. Women no, women aren't. Uh, and then, of course, on top of, it's, it's so funny, in one of the lectures, I was like, 
but all the profits were meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is it. That's... But then they have a problem with that as well. <laughs> Well, if they have a problem with that, they have a problem with God. Right? Exactly. And, <laughs> you know what I mean? and, 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 and unfortunately for some, it does, you know, I'm thinking of, um, oh God, I've forgotten her name. Well, well, it's, I'm thinking there's Layla Ahmed, isn't it? There's Fatima Mursi, yes. there's um, the other um, Fatima oh, who wrote Headscarves and Hymens, I've forgotten her name. Um, <laughs> you know, it's all those people who- You always choose those very provocative. Yeah, this is it. Um, but you're yeah that is very you're 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 right I think when um you know it's funny I'm part of um the thinking muslim team as well it's a podcast mm. thinking muslim podcast and then we have a website and again we've critiqued liberalists that's our main thing that we right. do we we actually we, we we the main thing that we're saying is that someone needs to critique liberalism and its right. effects that because liberalism is being given to us as the you know it's the golden fleece or something or that you know this was this is it but there are so many issues with it and um because again you have yeah. muslims who they're calling for the like well the feminist voice that you said but you've got men who are saying it as well that is you know islam needs to be reformed and get in line with every other religion what's the yeah. matter with you muslims you know um, in other words, rendering the guidance of Allah like meaningless, right? Because yeah. that is what's happened to Christianity, right? Yes, absolutely. And if that's what you want to happen to Islam, subhanAllah, we have Christians who actually contact the Muslim community and thank us, mm -hmm. you know, for taking a stand, mm -hmm. you know, things like yeah. RS and stuff yes. like that. Why? Because they're so, uh, they, their own leadership can't take a stand, right? Yeah, yeah when you water god's revelation down to such an extent mm. when you make everything just mean nothing right mm -hmm. you say it's all kind of you know mythical and whatever i don't know you know the different narratives that now exist regarding christianity and how they interpret the bible etc it renders the religion meaningless it's there's nothing there now right mm. yeah whatever society's doing yeah we, we'll be all right with that we'll just have to somehow right mm. and we as Muslims don't want to go down that way. No. So I think, so anyway, with, with regards to the academia thing, when I was reading these, I actually said to the professor, I said like, there are, this is not a balanced range of voices here, right? You know, mm. and then I realized that that's because those voices don't necessarily exist in academia. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe they're obscure because it feels as though maybe the types of people who go into academia and then do write on those topics mm -hmm. are the ones who have that you know leaning and that agenda mm -hmm. so one of the things and this is like a bit of a dream I, I don't know how, how we're gonna bring this about but <laughs> bear with me everyone now, that, I like I like your you've got big plans mashallah that's what I like I want to bring sisters or not just sisters it can be brothers or sisters voices into academia and I'm, i mean academic work right writings yeah uh, academic journals within academic journals and books etc that bring the counter narrative to all of this you know mm, yes with regards to women because mm. at the moment that's the only voice so what's happened like in a typical uh, class that's the only thing you get to hear i mean it's one of the first statements that was made in one of our classes and it was you know, in the literature was, yeah, classical Islam saw women as sexual objects. And, and, and the professor just went on and I was like, <sighs> you can't just say that. You, know, yeah, you can't just yeah. say that and just move on. And, and the, the rest of the, the problem is that at university, nobody, if you, unless you have knowledge yeah, and, and confidence, yeah. <laughs> right, nobody challenges it. Mm, yes. Like, and that's another thing I'm noticing that young Muslim women and men lack confidence mm -hmm. when it comes to questioning a narrative or mm. challenging a narrative. Yes. And so I'm afraid that what can happen when you're in that environment and that's like, you know, it's like the air around you, isn't it? It's like the mm. entire air around you. You will start looking at your deen in a negative way because oh, that's definitely the you're told. Yeah. How many people have gone to university and had their faith shaken and they didn't know that would happen? 
because you're right, it, the, the, when you study these topics, it's um, unless you have previous knowledge, you're going to accept this PhD, my PhD teacher is te te right. saying this, it must be true. And you're right, and there are no other voices, there's no alternative. And so you're right, as Muslims, I think we've, uh, hum okay, alhamdulillah, we dropped the ball, we need to pick it up again. And um, yeah, because I in other areas, we have gone in, like, for example, when you look at um, Islamic law in general, not related mm -hmm. to women, but just in general, mm -hmm. uh, and Orientalism in general, I feel like it's really been refuted, like, mm. I wouldn't say uh, everything has been done yet, but we've got so many academics who've dealt with it now, you know, like the whole mm. kind of shacht's whole thing of like how Islamic law was all made up in, in the third or fourth century or whatever, it, whatever his theory is. Mm. All of that has kind of been obliterated, you know, because uh, Muslim academics went in and it's not just Muslims, actually. It's people like Wa'il Halak as well, I guess, uh, who's an Arab who says he's not, he doesn't say he's a Muslim, but mm -hmm. people like him who've really provided a counter narrative, right? Mm -hmm. um, and refuted a lot of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's happening in different areas. Uh, but when it comes to women, mm. it feels like sis, even sisters who go into it, mm -hmm. they end up falling in line, you know? It, it's mm -hmm. like they just fall in line with with the feminist narrative regarding mm -hmm. women yeah yeah you're, and you're, I don't know why that is is it because it's so kind of all-encompassing that they get drawn into that mm. yeah or, or is well, it that uh, you they know, don't have classical training and so they don't yeah know? I think I think it's hard I wonder how easy it is for them you know with PhDs and to get funding if you want to come if you make it very clear in your um uh statement to begin with that you're coming from an islamic perspective who's going to give you funding who's going to say yeah i want we will support you and you can do this here you know you wonder then in the muslim world is that being done more um yeah. uh, O'Neill knows I, I don't know that but it's interesting that you know um through, through again through the thinking muslim that where we are oh, inshallah we are going to write, get this book written it is a count counter narrative of feminist ideas but even um the thing is that it does take a lot of time to research it like we did mm. we got a number of writers involved um now the thing is that covid happened and that kind of um really put a spanner in the works but the whole topic is very you have to really know your stuff to yes, because yes. before you, you know you have to have read a lot and understood the reality and and just and then understand the islamic perspectives so i think sometimes pete i think women can find it daunting um, so you need the time to be able to dedicate to reading, researching and making sure and checking, I think. And then that's a good thing that, would, that like, I'm just thinking from our perspective, we want to make sure we're not going to say anything incorrect and we're putting, getting the ideas right completely because, and that's what we're going to be presenting to people. Um, so like a bit like you're saying with the organization, you're taking your time, you're doing the thinking and that's a good thing. But I think mm -hmm. also, like, it's interesting, like when, when I was in my podcast, I did a whole season on feminism. I'm trying to get guests on. I think there's some people I did get on and they were happy to talk about things. But me, in the end, I thought I ended up doing a lot of the talking, just doing my reading and then doing the talking because there, there are not many Muslim, uh, maybe I, I'm going to, I actually, I'm thinking of Noor Golda from America. She, she knew stuff, um, Nodi Knight from US. Like there, but there were very few who could feel that, yeah, they could confidently speak about and constantly counter, um, yeah. counteract yeah. the arguments. But humbly, I think the more of us that do it, that will give confidence to others that, yeah. I think it's also because people literally feel bullied, you know, or oh, yeah. they're too, it's the whole thing that's happening in wider culture of political correctness, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's happening everywhere, right? Like mm. there's certain things you can't say, there's certain things you can't be against, there's certain mm. things you can't, you can't speak your mind, right? Mm. Um, and so people have become very super cautious, like, you yeah. know, they, they don't want to be seen as... Yeah, I think, I think like, we're self-censoring too much. Yes, yes. It's gone too I'm... far the other direction and because what can what's going to happen to you if you i think the main thing is to put it in a balanced way and speak the truth in a balanced manner you know um put, um right 
show the facts you know show your what books did you read to get this information they can find it out themselves because that's something i encourage a lot i'll tell people these are the books i've read these are the websites i read go and look yourself don't even just take it from me because then you yeah. don't want to just blindly follow what i'm saying uh, adopt ideas with conviction um, and don't, don't you think one of the don't you think one of the reasons why people lack confidence and they maybe self-censor is because nobody has given them a very compelling narrative to take and just make their own do you know what I mean like mm, yeah when, when you when you know what to have when you know how to counteract something mm. um, in a positive and in a way that is not you know sometimes like I feel like when we talk about feminism it becomes so negative that yes yes this is not feeling yeah but you're just ignoring all the yeah you know, oh, the real the issues that women are facing women, right? yeah but imagine if we were if we say no 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 we care about women's rights we care mm. about women and men's rights but we care about women's rights. we don't want there to be oppression we want to fix this stuff yeah but how are we going to do it not through feminism because yeah. these are the harms of feminism these are the harms that have been brought to society through feminism mm -hmm. and that are going to come your way if you follow yeah. that route but let's find how to address these issues it's not that we're denying these issues or we're saying yeah. that do you see what I mean yeah so exactly. that. but also I feel like we need to become skilled mm. as academics right mm -hmm. when it comes to academia um in articulating our argument hmm. in an unbiased way with yeah. evidence you know it's like a game isn't it like yes. <laughs> academia yeah. is a, a game it's like you've got to play by these rules yeah. play by the rules and speak the truth don't yes <laughs> don't play by the rules and then say what your professor wants you to say you know? yeah yeah like we need people who are willing to to hmm. do that yeah, I'm and I think, that. That. I think, yeah, and I yeah. think this is it. I think the more that we talk about this, yes, then people will do it. They'll see, okay, this is a field I should go into. That if I'm gonna, I have a choice what fields I can move into. Then this is an area that's been neglected. I'm gonna do something about it. You know, it's. Um, and I think again, here comes the bit like you were saying about as women, we can create a culture that rather than now, okay, becoming the certain professions that we just push our kids to go into. And you think, okay, I think, Hamza, I think we've got enough doctors now. We've got enough Muslim engineers. I know, like, I, I know I'm not criticizing anyone who goes into that, but it seems like we do, oh, certain fields are saturated with Muslims and mm -hmm. others aren't. So as parents and as older brothers and sisters, we could say to our, you know, our st student age, you know, youth that, how about going into this? But this is it, it's a culture change. About? Yeah, exactly. Anthropology and socio so, sociology and <laughs> yeah. all the different areas that a society needs to kind of yeah. be thinking about, right? Like in order to develop. So yeah, definitely. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, I, I just thought I'd share that with you because Alhamdulillah, that, was... that was another area that I just, I was just, okay, maybe I'm a bit naive, but I was a bit shocked that like at least when it came to Islamic law in general, there are different voices like yeah yeah voices represented and you could say oh okay that's a that's a good argument from the classical perspective and from mm -hmm. the no, it's but the what you're saying like, it is it is really yeah. true because I was that two years ago I was that close to enrolling in SOAS I actually looked at a number of universities and I was looking at women's studies gender studies feminism and then I looked at the lecturers and I looked at the content and I thought if I go there I'm just going to get their views that's all I will not there's no balance there so you're absolute and I thought that'll be a waste of money and a waste of time and then I thought okay I have to go down the independent route and just I'm gonna have to start doing my own reading and uh, because all I'm but gonna we, get is that but don't you think we we that's we also need people who are willing to go in it's almost like going into the to you know face the monster and yeah you're right <laughs> and, and like engage with it however annoying it is you know but mm. There's a level, like one of our professors at SOAS, he's, he's excellent. Inshallah, I'm going to interview him soon. He's, I would say he's classically trained, right? Like he's Nigerian. He, he was mm -hmm. uh, classically trained in a madrasa and a like Darul Uloom type thing in Nigeria. And then he went into academia. 
And one of the things he keeps saying to us, especially the students who've come from a classical Islamic studies background is, don't be so dismissive. You know, like <laughs> he's always saying, engage. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there, is, there is utility and benefit in engaging. You know? mm -hmm. And initially I was a bit skeptical of that, I must mm -hmm. say. Uh, what he meant is, and, I, and now that I've read a lot of his work, I've realized that SubhanAllah, like he's right, like, he does that himself, right? Um, is instead of dismissing this argument as, oh, it's just so Orientalist or Islamophobic or whatever, right? Or liberal, right? Mm -hmm. He says, engage with it, take it to its nth degree. Do you know what I mean? Like take mm -hmm. it to its conclusion and say, okay, this is what this person is arguing. Let's break that down. Let's Let's show the counter argument. Mm -hmm. Let's show the other way. Is there another way we could be looking at this? Is this something that this person hasn't thought of, you know? Something mm -hmm. that they think about, or a premise that is false, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. People who are willing to patiently <laughs> engage and take things apart and be willing to argue things properly without emotion, you know, because that's mm -hmm. difficult. It's very difficult to yeah. not be polemical in uh, as a <laughs> as somebody who really believes in something, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you can train yourself and try to do that, I think we could change the women's rights discourse mm. because at the moment, the reason why it's so feminist mm -hmm. and so kind of it's almost like there's only one way of thinking about women in Islam, right? Mm -hmm, in popular mm -hmm. culture and not just popular culture, in academia. Yeah. I think the reason why that is, is because the literature is saturated with those voices and those academics. Mm -hmm. but imagine if there was a death, a, a, a plethora of literature that was, you know, um, countering that narrative. Hmm. Then professors would be forced to use that as well, you know? Yeah, like, yeah they couldn't ignore reading. it. Yeah. <clears throat> right, and it would yeah. be, to the same level that that's another thing isn't it because mm. it might be there might be sisters writing stuff on blogs and here and but yeah in academia there's a certain standard you, yes. you've got to it's got to be peer reviewed and it's got to yeah. has to cut the mustard published. yeah <laughs> right so i'm not saying that academia is the be all and end all yeah but it's a branch it's another it's, area isn't it yeah it needs to be tackled and those so, ideas filter down, don't they? Yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. If you think of all the feminist writers, you know, okay, Betty Friedan, Wilson Calf, you know, all of them, they they wrote something and it's those books became the, you know, the Bibles of yeah. the movement. Um, but, um, well, okay, uh -huh. Fatima, it's been, oh, yeah. I could, we could talk for ages, couldn't yeah. we? <laughs> but, so can you so if 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 listeners or um, viewers would like to support the your put your project go to launch good isn't it inshallah they can donate there launchgood.com slash muslim women i will Help put the link our target for this ramadan what is the target oh. it's twenty thousand. yeah yes yes and we've oh, reached inshallah. nearly 10 now oh so. mashallah that's wonderful so if, um you know i just feel like this is the first stage yeah. So the more people can support us, it's like you will be the first responders, right? Like you'll be yeah. the first who, who invested in this. And um, please make a lot of dua for us as well, yes. because uh, I think the time is right, you know, for this. Yes. And, um, and there's no time like the present. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the, like you said, the privilege and also the, the experience, you know, because... Mm. Sometimes I reflect and I think, wow, you know, the certain experiences Allah took me through and, uh, and, and some of the members of my team as well. Like we were put in the middle of these amazing Dawah organizations and without us really planning it, you know, like mm -hmm. and we're involved in big projects. And then I, I was traveling and I met people like Dr. Farhat Hashmi and, oh, mashallah. and other sisters who like, I, was, I felt like I was being shown things, you know, and people yeah. and, their, and their work mm -hmm. um, and sort of potential that was there, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's time for action now. So yeah, please, alhamdulillah. 
Alhamdulillah, yeah, inshallah, we will all be doing the well for this project. Inshallah, Allah make it a success. And Mela, reward you for your good intentions, all the sisters involved, your good intentions and your efforts and being baraka in this for, for everyone, inshallah. Um, okay, then, inshallah, we'll speak again soon. Take care, Fatima. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.